Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, folks, welcome to a Monday morning edition of Locked On Seminoles. We're happy to have you here. We love that you're here. And today we're going to talk about the thing that we all love, me, Drake, and Dave are going to go through the Florida State roster, and we're not going to give a full position breakdown. What we're going to do is we're just going to say for each position group, do we think this year it will be a net improvement, a net non-improvement, a net regression? Decline? Yeah, a net decline or a regression, or about the same level of play as we saw last year. There's got to be gonna a be better re- statistic term for stay the same than just, you know, stay the same. Because you had net positive, you had net regression. You can't just say stay the same, my guy. It's stay the same. It's stay, it stay the same, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're going to look at through that lens. Now, one important caveat, we're going to be talking about from this time last year. So we'll be looking at improvements the groups made over the course of last season because we're trying to say, hey, what should we be expecting with the team we currently have relative to what we were expecting with the team we had going into fall camp last year? But an even more important announcement, and this is in no way due to the suggestions of one commenter named Pappy Gilmore, so please don't think I care about your opinion or listen to you in any way. But because of some creative changes here at Locked On Seminoles and a few things that we're going to be doing as we get to the season, we're going to be handing over main hosting duties from myself, to our very own Andre Silva. So with that being said, make sure you all subscribe to the YouTube. We're at 1,300 strong now. Make sure that you guys like the video. And Captain, the con is yours. Thank you, sir. And as always, we want to thank you guys for, for making Locked On Seminoles your first listen each and every single day. And also thank our title sponsor, LinkedIn. LinkedIn helping us get create and get acquired new jobs every single day. So guys, we talked about the death breakdown, kind of what we want to do first. And you know, we were kind of the opinion all here that Let's start off with the most important position on the field, and that is the quarterback position. Max, since Jordan is your boy, you've been the president of the uh, JT13 fan club since probably when you saved us against Jacksonville State the first time. Why don't you kick kick us off here? Yeah, so if we're looking at net positive, net regression, or neutral, we have a net positive at the quarterback position from where we started last year simply because we now know who our starter is going to be. And there is absolutely no way, in my opinion, that Jordan Travis this year can be worse than Mackenzie Milton was last year or than Jordan Travis was last year. Now, there's a lot of things to unpack with Jordan Travis, but most people ignore how efficient he's been and how good he's been. Now, is Jordan Travis the best quarterback in the country? Absolutely not. But you're looking at a guy with a 63% completions percentage. You're looking at a guy who, in 2020 had a one-to-one touchdown-to-interception ratio. In 2021, he had a three-to-one touchdown-to-interception ratio. By the way, only one receiver had more than two touchdown catches, so he didn't have a lot of targets to throw to, meaning he was probably responsible for most of those touchdowns. What I mean by that is, think about it. If you have a guy like um, Kenny Pickett, right, and 40% of his touchdowns are to Jordan Addison. Now, Kenny Pickett's a great quarterback, but those are just two good examples. You have to ask yourself, who's responsible for most of those touchdowns? Is it Kenny Pickett being a great quarterback, or is it Jordan Addison being the best receiver in the country? The answer is probably somewhere in the middle, but Jordan Travis didn't have anything like that. He had to spread the ball around, and I think it was, what, eight different pass catchers caught a touchdown last year? Something like that. Yeah, Yeah. so he was the main main one responsible for our passing touchdowns. You look at his improvement from 2020 to 2021, 58% completion up to 63% completions. You look at his efficiency metrics. He's a top 40 quarterback in the country in passing efficiency. Now, what are the knocks against Jordan Travis? One, injury. But guys, that was a knock last year, right? Was the injury thing. So when we're talking net positive, net negative, this isn't a Jordan Travis versus the world discussion. This is a current state of the QB room versus last year. That doesn't change. Like there's, He's not going to be more injury prone this year than he was last year. And in fact... I would argue he's going to be less injury prone because you have a better offensive line and you're probably going to have a lot more weapons that are going to get open, meaning he's going to have to take off and run less or at least not be the second second place in the ACC in sacks taken. 
He also Hopefully. has gained about 15 pounds. I think he's, what, around 215, 220 now. He's kind of basically yep. playing around that uh, Malik Rozier weight that we saw in 2018 where he had 3,000 yards passing, led Miami to, I think, what, that 10-0 start? Yeah, exactly. So the injury stuff is there, but again, as far as net positive, net negative, that doesn't really matter. And finally, we have no reason to think he's going to regress as a runner. So to sum it up, we have seen Jordan Travis never get to be the, the full-time starter going into camp. Now he has gotten to be designated QB1 starting all through spring and all through fall camp. Number two, he's improved year after year in percentage in every measurable thing. And the biggest one I look at is that one-to-one touchdown to interception ratio in 2020, moving that up to a three-to-one touchdown to interception ratio in 2021. Yeah, 2020 to 2021. And if he can just stay the same this year, if he can just stay the same and throw the number of passes that him plus McKenzie Milton threw last year, he's going to have a good enough year where with the running back room, which we'll talk about, and the defense we expect to have, there's no reason this team can't win seven or eight games. Yeah, and well, to add one thing to your point, if that's going to be an improvement, the offensive line, I expect to be better. There's a little foreshadowing. We'll get to that. Uh, But I have a different answer. Um, If we're talking about comparing where we are going into this season to where we were going into last season, I think it's going to be about the same. And the reason I say that is because I had higher hopes for Mackenzie Milton than Mackenzie Milton turned out to be last year. Going into last season, I was very excited about the prospect of what he could bring to the table uh, based on what we'd seen previously in his career. Um, I liked the prospect of Chubba Purdy. I thought he could have been very good here. And when he did play last year, he was very good here. We no longer have that. We have a true freshman, AJ Duffy, who I do think in his career will be very good here. But don't say I don't Gino English and hit it wrong. Okay. Guy. I'm Come not on. here for that conversation. Don't you do that? No, but it's a it's a very good point. I think what you're saying is if we look at the QB room as a whole, is it in a better place? And I yeah. think that's a very that's a very valid argument you're making. I, I I hadn't thought of it that way. I was just thinking Jordan Travis, but I don't know, Drake, let's get your opinion on this. Like if, if Jordan Travis gets hurt this year, do you feel better or worse? I don't mean hurt for the whole season, but a game. He's let's say his helmet gets knocked off against LSU. Do you feel better or worse? than you did last year when his helmet got knocked off. I probably honestly feel the same. Um, okay. And it's kind of like kind of what Dave was saying. I, two of us were extremely high on Mackenzie Milne. One of the one caveat I did say was he'll either, you know, be back to the way he was or he'll be the same way as Alex Smith, who had a very similar uh, catastrophic athletic injury. I think it's more that feels the same. It's not because of the talent in the room. I think JT actually is a better QB than last year. I agree um, with that. As I said, you know, or when we were discussing that on Friday, he's, I think, is a slightly below passer, but he's an elite runner. Um, I think it's more the, of the amount of depth that we have in the room. Tay Rodemaker, I don't have the strongest faith in him to be a power five starting QB. Uh, AJ Duffy, I have high hopes for the kid, but he is what nine months removed from playing high school football. And then yep. we have Gino English, a non scholarship QB. As much as like a joke about it, it's like it's you only have four QBs, so the depth to me is a concern. Yep. But I really think that this might be the best QB room talent wise, I think we've had in a little bit primarily because of the, the three at the top, but it's a lot of unknown. Like, can Jordan stay healthy? Can Tate finally, you know, go, become, go from a practice warrior to actually someone that actually doesn't fall underneath the lights? And then also, what do we have in A.J. Duffy? So that's kind of where mm-hmm. I stand out overall with the state of the QB. Yeah, and just to be clear, my opinion is that if Jordan Travis stays healthy for 12 games, that the quarterback position will be better. But mm-hmm. factoring in that injury concern, which is there the way he plays, puts his heart out there every play, I expect him to get injured, hopefully not badly at some point. And whoever's coming in to spell him, I'm not looking forward to that. And at least with Mackenzie Milton, we'd seen him do something in his career that was impressive. Right. And again, if we're thinking like where we were this time last year, you know, when that helmet came off, we thought, oh, good. Mackenzie Milton's going in. So like, at least on first thoughts, I'm going to be real worried if number he's number 18, right? AJ Duffy. No, AJ Duffy's number 10. Number 10, okay. But either I'm going to be real worried of him or Tate Rodemaker jogging out on that field in the New Orleans Superdome with LSU. But hey, last thing I'll say before we move on, Clint Trickett surprised us in that Oklahoma game. When he came in, had EJ been able to go back in, maybe we win that because Clint did come in and throw a touchdown. I have no explanation for that happening. I do. Did did I tell you I played hockey with Clint Trickett? You did, yeah. Yeah, we played pickup roller hockey together while he was in college. And I'll never forget this. It's a funny story. Um, We were in the playoffs of our rec league, you know, and uh, we had to go to a shootout. And Clint goes, all right, man, 
no pressure. Just pretend that there's like 85,000 people. You're playing number two in the country and the starter just went down and you've got to get out there and do what I did. Score. <laughs> The confidence was, was there, at like, least. Was like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, that's just the way he said it. I, was I like, would fight somebody right now for, right. like, last season of clincher at West Virginia. I would fight somebody to have that actually in my QB room. But you know what I don't have to fight for anymore? Getting a job because of our title sponsor today of LinkedIn. Max, you're a big fan of LinkedIn, aren't you? Dude, LinkedIn jobs is how I found my job. I mean, I, I you know, especially if you're someone like me and you went to Florida State or you went to Penn State, which both have massive alumni bases, and you're looking for a job, you know, look, if you go on Indeed, all you're going to see is the job. You go to LinkedIn Jobs, you see what company it's for. Well, you can go look up, okay, do, are there any alumni of my school that work there? And you can start networking before you even apply for the job. So, yeah, I love LinkedIn Jobs. I mean, LinkedIn Jobs shows you all the connections, as Max is talking about, all the groupings as well. And basically, it's great for small businesses. I made, small businesses. I made the transition from being a large firm to a much smaller firm. And also, it's great for myself, great for my mentors, and also, it's great for my wallet. But, folks... LinkedIn Jobs help you, helps you find the candidates you want to talk faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college, and that's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for the free, for the free, and it's always for the free at linkedin.com. All right, folks, we're back, and now we discussed Jordan Travis. Now we have to discuss who we'd actually throw in the ball to. Now we move on to the wide receivers, and just a heads up, folks, I'll be looking at my monitor over here because I have my PFF grades up of everyone that has departed and also that has come in because I think we've grabbed, what, four transfers out of the wide receiver you know, portal? So, like, Dave, since Max are the last one, why don't we start with you? Yeah, this, this can't be any answer in, in terms of how we're looking going into this season versus how we were looking going into last season. You can't have any answer other than a net positive here at the receiver position. Just the fact alone that the coaching staff recognized how big of an issue that position was and said, we're not going to go out and get our one, one or two receivers from the portal. They said, we're going to revamp this entire position group and brought in former four-star talent, multiple of them, Johnny Wilson, Micah Pittman, um, and a, a star player in Winston Wright Jr. I know he's injured, but he'll be back. Um, those are three players that could make a massive impact just in terms of the transfers coming in. And you also expect the players, some, some of the younger guys that have been here, like Malik McLean, maybe a Josh Burrell to make that next step. And this could easily be the most improved position on the team. And if it's not, I'll actually be kind of surprised and add to that, that you have returning veteran talent on this team, you know, and Ontario Wilson and Keyshawn Helton. Those are two guys that, you know, they may not be like the best receivers Florida State's ever had, but you know what you're going to get from them. And to have them as guys that you're not having to rely on as starters on next year's team necessarily, that's invaluable. Uh, so just even if you hadn't added this massive influx of talent uh, in the transfer portal, I probably still would have said I thought it'd be a net positive just because I really do expect Malik McLean to have that Tamori and Terry type of year. Um, but just given everything else you added in, there's no way this position group just doesn't improve in, in, incredibly from last year. So even though I guess Micah Pittman, Johnny Wilson, I'll probably also do span just because they're not they're not super proven products. Like just because we're added four of them in, and also how I guess lackluster the entire group was as a whole, you should, you'll see it as not positive regardless. Yeah, I mean, well, look, Winston Wright, we know what we're getting in him. Like, assuming he comes back all right from his injury, he was a star player at West Virginia. We know exactly what we're getting in him. Uh, Micah Pittman apparently has looked very good in camp. Uh, we know exactly what we're getting from him as a returner, and I expect him to be uh, reliable over the middle at a minimum, which is, you know, that's, that's important for Jordan Travis, who we've talked about. Um, his performance over the middle of the field, in my eyes, leaves a lot to be desired. And if we're going to add receivers in there, like Micah Pittman, who I expect to help with that, uh, again, that that's only going to add a net positive from last year. Yeah, I mean, the reality is last year you had one scholarship receiver over six foot four, <laughs> and that was Malik McLean. And this year you've got three. You've got Malik McLean, you've got Deuce Span, and you've got Johnny Wilson. And Kendron Portier is a 6'3", that you yep. could argue for a 6'4", but he was there last year. So for me, it's one word, or sorry, one phrase, and one phrase only. Body diversity. Last year, you had the same looking guys, and our correspondent, Hunter Steele, made this point uh, last week when he said, look, we were throwing our goal line fade routes to Keyshawn Helton half the time, who's 5'10". You know, we, we now have legitimate threats. 
that can confuse defenses and can make them commit to things, right? Let's just put it this way. Let's say we're on the goal line and we have to throw a fade. Well, last year, again, you had one guy that could catch the fade and it was Malik McLean. So whatever side he's on, the number one cornerback was on him and they were probably cheating the safety over to that side too. Maybe you'd be able to get something across the middle, but you didn't have those hard, aggressive route runners that were going to be able to fight for space in the middle and give you that check down. This year, you're going to be able to put big guys on both sides and make them pick which side is going to get safety help and which side isn't because you can't run two safeties in a goal line situation. And finally, you're going to have Micah Pittman, who is an absolute bulldog by all accounts, who's going to be able to fight for that in the middle. And by the way, the guy I'm most excited about, that from watching him in spring, I think is a huge net positive to the room, even though he was there last year, is Josh Burrell. Mm -hmm. Because in this situation, Josh Burrell becomes the wild card. You know that you've got the Micah Pittman, the dog, going in motion, going to be able to fight for stuff over the middle. Maybe you put Debo. two tall guys on the outside, but then you've got a six foot three. Let me see what, what Josh Burrell is currently listed at. Sorry, six foot two, 225 pound receiver yep. that you're going to put in some kind of H back, some kind of slot position that if Cam McDonald doesn't step up and take the step forward, is going to be able to also force a linebacker to get pulled out of the middle. And because of that body diversity and the threats you've now created, you're not only opening up a lot in the end zone, you're not opening up a run from the guys we'll probably talk about next because you're pulling out so many guys to cover the outside, which last year just wasn't really a threat. So I think this room is a huge net positive from last year. And I can agree more with all three of y'all. I think one of the big things that I think all the beat talked about was basically how we had a lot of wide receiver threes. And basically the yep. one thing was that we like Keyshawn Helton. Just he yep. should not be your number one option on a power five team. I mean, he works hard. He's shifty enough, but he did come back from a very devastating knee injury. That's kind of more, more my concerns with Joshua Burrell. He did have the foot injury, I think, against yep. Notre Dame. So we'll see how he is fully back. But we have Winston Wright Jr., who was all Big 12, I want to say, two seasons ago as yep. a wide receiver, which is something that the Big 12, I mean, like it's – I know they don't play defense. That's something I know that you have said and you have said, and I've also it's, said it on occasion too. But Winston Wright Jr. is also going to be probably the – I think he'll be back by week two, probably. I wouldn't see him actually at the Duquesne game. I know people want to see him as the uh, go against the lesser competition, but I'm pretty sure that he'll probably be back by LSU. So to me, this is a huge, huge net positive. I'm not a doc. Two things. For, I'll start with the easier one first. I'm not a doctor, but do, would it really make sense to not bring him back against Duquesne if you think he'll be ready for LSU? At least let him run. Kind of like Jalen Waddell in the national championship, at least let him run some decoy routes and the, let him get out there at live speed. The only concern I have is that I think you pointed it out. It's like was it Jalen Waddell? Did I get that right? Yeah, you got it right, actually. Yeah. That's pretty good. You're pretty good. Guys, you I'm never, learning you names never, now. You, you're, you're I'm mean, impressed now. by that. It's, yeah, it's, I, a new, it's a new day here at Locked On Seminoles. Yeah, funny enough, you learn you start to learn names now, but no, I think really it's more like how you point out with Citadel. They're not good at blocking or anything, so they actually do a lot of the chop blocking and hurt your players. True. I wouldn't be surprised if the cornerback plays a lot more feistier on the outside with wide receivers because Fair. they're higher percentage. So you know what? I wouldn't risk that. So I that guess it's also like what do you – what right, what, to, to counter my own point with what you just said, like what do you really gain from trotting him out there against against Duquesne other than, again, like the Derwin James versus uh, – who did he get hurt against, Citadel? Was it Citadel? No, guy? it was um, – I want to say ULM maybe, right? I think that's right. No, it was someone even worse than – it was some like, like – Old just, Dominion or <laughs> – It was some team he had no business I remember that, yeah. Um, but but either way, yeah, I think this is a huge positive. And also, uh, I, I, the reason I made the face about Winston Wright Jr. is we are hearing good things, but I am, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on him a bit until we really see what he looks like running routes and like plays and stuff in fall camp because – it was a bad injury what he went through, and um, you know I, I wouldn't hold it against him if if he doesn't if he doesn't come back right away or at least at least isn't at full strength. But yeah, I think we uh, I think we all agree net positive in the wide receiver room. Charleston Southern. Charleston yeah. Southern. I knew it was someone that was just like. Although isn't the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, or somewhere close? To yeah, it's in, it's in South Carolina. Uh, no one knows. And folks, we will be remiss here at Locked On Semmels and talk about friends over at betonline.net. Betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. And as always, folks, we'll do the Fade Dave segment of today's uh, episode. And Dave, let me give yes. you a win total really quick. Yes. Arkansas regularly season win total. Under, over, under seven and a half wins. What are you taking with Sam Pittman's Hogs? Under, that was a total aberration last year. They're going to win like four games. 
There you have it, folks. So take <laughs> the over at seven and a half to fade Dave because you know Dave is terrible with his finances. But, folks, head on over to bandline.net and use promo code LOCKED ON. That's L O C K E D O N. And you'll get a 100% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Once again, promo code LOCKED ON, L O C K E D O N. Bandline, where the game starts. And now, gentlemen, we're towards the end of today's episode. So let's kind of, you know, package it all in, get the probably two most important positions of our team overall, because we're going to talk about offensive linemen and running backs. Now, Dave, Dave you won the last time. Max yep. won the first time. Let's wrap it up. There. Let's go back around. Max, do you want to do running backs first and the emergence of Trey Benson, or do you want to talk about the big uglies of the front led by our Cartier-wearing offensive guard, Dylan Gibbons? <laughs> Well, these positions are tough for me, Driz, because you know I'm our I'm our numbers guy. I'm the nerd. I'm I'm digging here over in a, an Excel file that's over a gigabyte. Which, if you're a database person, don't at me. I'm not gonna. I don't have the time to learn how to use real database software. Um, and, and these are such these are such qualitative positions, right? So, I think I'd like to start at running backs because oh. um, I, I think that that at least we know what we're trying to replace. Whereas if we look at offensive line, we brought in a lot of transfers, but we're not really replacing any key pieces. We're just adding to what we already had. So I think we need to talk about having to replace Jay Sean Corbin. Is this going to be a net positive compared to last year, a net negative, or is it going to be stagnant? And I think knowing what we know right now, based on what we knew last year, it's stagnant. Because I don't think last year we knew – last year the big concern was will Jay Sean ever get his home run speed back? Because remember the year before we saw flashes, but he just didn't have that second gear. The Notre Dame game changed that pretty damn quick. We saw that second gear and we're like, okay, he's back. We're going to have the same questions about C Cedric Benson, right? Like we saw him in the spring Trey game. Benson, Trey Benson. Say, why do I always say Cedric? Come on. We're going to have the same questions about Trey Benson. We saw him in the spring game. We saw some bursts, but again, that's, that's a spring game. You know, it's, it's not, it's not the same. And that was in April. He's got four months until the Duquesne game to, to heal up that injury even more. And maybe that burst will come back. I hope it does. But where we sit right now, we don't know. We also have Treshawn Ward, who I think will be, a more featured back in this offense. And I wonder if he's ready for that. You know, is he the good vice president that isn't ready to be CEO or is he the guy that has improved to the point where he could be the number one back? I think he's a great player. I think what he's done from being a three-star that turned away other scholarship offers to be a walk-on has been incredible. But I think that the concerns that it's mostly been you Drake that's raised him about his top end speed are very valid. I mean, we saw in the Notre Dame game, he got the exact same look, the exact same blocking in the exact same hole. And everything was almost identical as that Jay Sean Corbin run. And he got dragged down at the 20 instead of making it to pay dirt. So I don't know if he's ready to take on that role. But again, since last year, we didn't know what Jay Sean was going to be. I think from here versus where we were this time last year, it's a neutral. I, I do think, though, it is going to be a bit of a regression by the end of the year compared to how that room performed last year. Yeah, that, that drastically changes the answer. I mean, if you're talking about knowing what you're losing in Jay Sean Corbin, he was one of the most effective runners in the country per PFF. Um, that's, that's irreplaceable. He was Drake. Was that, really? that yes. Uh, that that's, you can't just replace that and you can't replace it with a guy who notwithstanding how good he's looked in spring and what the coaches have said and what the players have said about him. Um, we still have to see, uh, we still have to see Benson do it on the field when it counts and against LSU, for example. Um, I, I'm not going to care what I see against David DeQuesney's team. Uh, that's just not going to tell me much. But going into last year, you're right, Max, um, that we I had really high hopes for Jay Sean Corbin because he was that four star blue chip running back that Jimbo wanted when he was here, that Jimbo got to go over with him to Texas A&M that looked good on tape there. We loved what we saw to DJ Williams going into last year, obviously at the end of the season that didn't amount to much. So um, going into last season, I think I probably had more that I was excited about than going into this year, but knowing what Trayshawn Ward is now going into this year versus just 
not having any idea what he was going to be going into last year, I think that probably evens the equation. Uh, so it's probably about the same to me. And unless we're talking about from the end of the year to last year to this year, because clearly uh, that's a drop off. I think it's, I think your answer to this question depends on how you feel Trey Benson is going to be when the season's over. Um, and Dave and I, when Trey Benson first committed to Florida State, we were not super high on him. Yep. Primarily because he did come off, as Max was talking about, a devastating knee injury. Now with Jay Sean, he came out of the gate super hot against Notre Dame. Then Jacksonville State played well, Louisville, Syracuse. The last, though, the last game he played, I guess, above average replacement level player for PFF was NC State. Clemson, 54 and a half, which Clemson, top tier defensive line. But then Miami, 59, Boston College, 62, Florida, 60.4. So you look overall, towards the end, Jay Sean kind of like wore down a little bit. And this is also in a running back room where he's not asked to shoulder the load as, you know, a Tony Pollard and Tony Gibson back over Memphis, but also you're not the same way as Jameer gets at Georgia Tech. So to me, I think at the end of the year, this kind of beat me, me more, I guess, with the predicting and the projecting. I think this will end up being a slight net positive because I do think Trey Benson might be the best running back that we've had probably since Cam Akers. And this is some kid that basically, speed-wise, you can see it there. I know it was a spring game, but you definitely saw that all the concerns about his lateral movement, agility, quickness, and speed kind of were alleviated with that game. And to me, Lawrence Tofili might be the wild card we're not talking about here as well because he's someone that we've asked constantly, please, go eat a cheeseburger. You need to gain a little bit of weight. And he actually has gained weight over this offseason. We already see the home run speed and also just the big playability, like the Clemson touchdown uh, pass catch that he had against Jordan Travis with them. So to me, I think it's a slight net positive actually for his entire group overall. Yeah. yeah, I just, when, when I look at the usage, right, from last year, and, and I'm looking at these numbers, uh, Jay Sean Corbin was your number one back by a significant margin. You know, this isn't a, this isn't a situation where um, it was like McKenzie and, and Jordan splitting it, right? You had um, Jay Sean Corbin had 143 carries, um, mm-hmm. and Trey Sean Ward had 81. So, Ooh, okay. uh, I yeah, so, on that. yeah, so you look at it, and it's, it's, it, you're going to have to ask Trey Sean Ward to have 50, Sorry, that, that means Trayshawn Ward had 56% of the carries that Jay Sean Corbin had. So for him to have that many carries, if I know math right, what is it? New divided by old minus one should give us the net change. You're going to need him to ha- take on 76% more carries. Now, when we look at their rushing stats, right, Trayshawn Ward averaged 6.4 yards a carry. Jay Sean Corbin averaged eight point or 6.2 yards a carry. Their longs were almost... Uh, or sorry, the longs heavily favor Treshawn there. Treshawn's long was 65. Jayshon's was 89. Why I say that favors Treshawn is because that means his 6.2 was more consistent given there were less home run shots in there. Mm-hmm. That being said, to our conversation about Jordan, when you look at numbers like that, it's really tough to one to, to try and predict it, are numbers going to stay consistent against the sample size when you're... Or, when you expand a sample size by 76%. Now, the next question comes up. Are you going to have to ask him to take on as many carries as Jay Sean took on when you still have Lawrence Toe Philly, but now you've got the CJ kid that we're hearing a lot of great things from. You've got hopefully an improved, not just Lawrence Toe Philly, but an improved Lawrence Toe Philly. Will you be able to spread those carries out? Now I've got one more question, and these are all questions you have to answer yourself. Your number two carrier last year was Jordan Travis with 134. Shouldn't the goal this year be to get Jordan less carries to keep him healthier if he's improved as a passer? So it's like, okay, he doesn't need to carry, Treshawn doesn't need to carry the ball as much as Jay Sean, but we also want the running backs as a whole to take more carries. And I just worry, like, can this room without Jay Sean Corbin be asked to take on, to one, make up for Jay Sean's 143 carries, and two, take on an additional 70 or so carries to take that, that pressure off Jordan. That really worries me. And I'm not saying we're going to have a bad running room by any cha- by any means, but that was unquestionably the strength of this team last year. And I'm kind of leaning from neutral to, I almost think it's a bit of a regression as I'm looking at it now from last year's running back room. Right. And, and it's he, here's the next thing we're going to talk about what they'll be asked to do and what they'll have to do. Okay. Here's what impact. Here's what impacts that a lot to me. Um, last year, the offensive line. I want to read you our five starting offensive linemen's run blocking grades per PFF. Okay. 61.2, 64.3, 66.3, 42.7, and 
was that's DLT bad. 42.7? Uh, DLT was 42.7. Yeah. So the run blocking was bad last year, meaning the running back performance, especially with Jayshon Corbin t- uh, and, and Trayshawn Ward, was in spite of run blocking. I think having a known quantity uh, as quickly as he developed in Jayshon Corbin helped Trayshawn Ward and vice versa. Um, so uh, if, if the run blocking doesn't get better this year, I don't know if that kind of performance is going to be sustainable from the running back position, uh, but that's the good thing. Do we think the offensive line is going to get better from last year? I think the answer has to be yes, um, because we've seen the offensive line get better every year under Atkins. Obviously, the running the run blocking didn't really get much better last year, but I don't expect that to continue. I do worry about Atkins having to take on offensive coordinator duties, whether that's going to affect the performance of the offensive line at all, or how much they improve, like he's shown to be able to do in other aspects with the offensive line. But um, again, another position where we added quality transfers, um, Bless Harris, Caden Lyles, et cetera. We, we've, we've added quality depth and we've added potential starters to that position group, to a position group that was already young enough that... Um, it probably was going to get better just by virtue of getting older and more time in the system and more time in the weight room and under Atkins. I do think the run blocking and the offensive line position as a result will get better overall. And as it relates to the running back position, I think that's obviously going to help them. If run blocking gets better or just the offensive line in any way gets better, it's going to help the running back room. And it was, thank God, I think that's kind of where I'm leaning more a little too because Jason, losing Jason Corbin's a massive loss. That's a kid that, quite frankly, like we yeah. didn't th- we didn't know if the burst was going to be back there, and we saw it at least the, throughout the entire year, even with a very mediocre offensive line run blocking. But if you look at the offensive line now, as Dave, you were talking about, you add in quality transfers that I think the only person that's guaranteed starting spot from last year starting five is Dylan Gibbons. I mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprised if Dimitri Emanuel, who's a kid that we haven't touched on yet from Charlotte, he averaged out, you know, a 59.3 run blocking wise. But last time he was under Al- Atkins, his run blocking was 6.2. And that's someone's going to replace DLT uh, actually along that left side. So to me, with this offensive line, I think we're going to be, it's going to be surprising to us, shocking to us. And we'll talk about that more actually next time we're on here because we're running out of time. But folks, please, thank you guys so much for loving sport. And as always, five star reviews, you know, Out Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast from. And Dave, let them know what we're doing YouTube. Oh boy. All right. So subscribe to the channel. Um, ding the little bell uh, at the top. Uh, leave a comment below. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you didn't like. Uh, if it's a good comment, we'll talk about it on Mandatory Mailbag Mondays or Tuesdays whenever we're doing that now. Drake, did I hit everything? Max, what do you forget? No, I think you nailed it. Like the video. Hit subscribe and make sure you, you ding that bell. Oh, forgot to like the video part. But oh, as always, well, you know. But as always, folks, like it. thank you guys for most, so much for love and support. This was Drake. That was Dave. And that was Max. And we'll see you all next time on Lockdown Sunrise. Take care, everybody. Don't open.